I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. This is episode 4, The Good Titans and Zeus's New World Order. Last time on the pod, I picked up from Kronos gobbling up his own children, with his wife Rhea's attempt to save her youngest son Zeus. A rock was wrapped up to look like the infant Zeus and given to Kronos, while the real Zeus was smuggled away to be raised in secret. Zeus grew up and finally returned to overthrow his father and save his brothers and sisters from the gastric juice-filled passages of Kronos' intestines. The following ten-year war between the Titans and Olympians is known as the Titanomachy, and it was a grueling series of battles between two evenly matched sides. But Zeus finally tipped the scales in favor of the Olympians when he freed the Cyclopses and the Hecatonchires. The Cyclopses returned the favor by providing Zeus with lightning, the secret weapon needed to finally defeat the Titans. At the end of the Titanomachy, Kronos and the Titans were imprisoned in Tartarus, the deepest part of the underworld. Most of the Titans that fought with Kronos in the war subsequently joined him in Tartarus after the Olympians' victory. One of the younger Titans that fought Zeus was given a different punishment, though. This was Atlas, who seems to have served as some kind of general to Kronos and was not imprisoned in Tartarus. Instead, he was made to hold up the heavens. Now, the Titanomachy was not a clear war between Olympians and Titans. There were some Titans that fought on the side of the Olympians, or at the very least did not actively fight with Kronos. Of the original six male Titans, Oceanus and Hyperion did not participate in the Titanomachy. Today, I'll go over who exactly were these good Titans that played a role in setting up Zeus's world. One of them was Metis. Metis's name means cunning intelligence or cleverness, and she is the cleverest, most knowledgeable of our large divine family. She is one of the younger generation of Titans. She was one of the 3,000 Oshinids, the daughters of Oshinus and Tethys. So you can consider Metis both a Titan and a sea nymph. The Greek Apollodorus directly tells us that Metis helped Zeus in the war against Kronos. According to Apollodorus, she was one of the first divine beings to side with Zeus. It was Metis who gave Kronos the emetic drug that caused him to vomit up Zeus's swallowed siblings. After the Olympians defeated the Titans, Zeus, now king of the universe, made Metis his first wife. But Apollodorus also suggests that maybe this wasn't a completely consensual relationship. He says that Metis was a shapeshifter and tried to turn into many different shapes to avoid Zeus's embraces. In Greek myths, sea gods and sea nymphs have shape-shifting powers, and there are plenty of examples of them turning into different sea creatures very quickly when they are grabbed by gods and heroes. Whatever the nature of their relationship, though, Zeus got Metis pregnant, and it is at this point where the pattern set in motion when Kronos deposed Uranus almost comes back into play. You see, Gaia had provided Zeus with another prophecy. Previously, Gaia told Kronos that one of his children would overthrow him, and that is the gist of what Gaia now tells Zeus. Metis becomes pregnant with a daughter, bright-eyed Tritogenia, also called Athena. Gaia tells Zeus that Athena will be equal to him in strength and in intelligence. Gaia tells Zeus that after giving birth to Athena, Metis will then conceive a son, a son more powerful than Zeus, who would become a new king of gods and mortals. Zeus's response to this threat was very similar to Kronos's. Instead of eating his own children after each is born, though, Zeus tries preventing the very conception of the son who will depose him. Zeus takes the pregnant Metis in his arms and swallows her whole. But Metis was not killed by this, nor does it seem that she was offended. Inside Zeus, she continued to provide him with her intelligence and cleverness, and was said to counsel him in both good and evil plans. Within Zeus, though, the unborn Athena continued to grow, and Zeus will ultimately be responsible for giving birth to her later. But, by swallowing Metis, the son of Zeus prophesied to defeat him was never conceived. For Zeus, this is mission accomplished. With his first wife inside him, Zeus now gets a new partner. His second wife is his aunt, Themis, one of the original twelve titans. Themis is the titan of the natural order of things, divine law, tradition, and sometimes also justice. From that list, you can understand why it was necessary for Zeus, our new lord of everything, with getting Themis on side. Zeus and Themis were the parents of multiple daughters. These daughters fit directly into the new world order Zeus was creating. Their daughters are the Hori, a group of goddesses whose responsibility is the seasons. They are named Thalo, the goddess of spring, Oxo, the goddess of summer, and Carpo, the goddess of the autumn, or the harvest. In ancient Greece, there were only considered to be three seasons, so there's no fourth season here. Hesiod also gives another group of daughters, Eunomia, Order, Dyke, Justice, and Blooming Irene, Peace. 
Having Themis as a mother makes sense as all three are personifications that fit in with Themis's own functions. These three are sometimes grouped in with Thalo, Oxo, and Carpo as Hore. In other traditions, additional goddesses are added to this bunch too. In addition to separating the year into seasons, the Hore also have another responsibility. Apparently, they were also the keepers of Olympus's gates, controlling who entered and exited the home of the gods. Now, back in episode 2, I described how, like Gaia, Nyx, the knight, was able to have multiple offspring by herself without a male partner. Near the beginning of the Theogony, Hesiod includes the Moirae, the three fate goddesses, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos, as three of the daughters of Nyx. But, much later in his own poem, Hesiod contradicts himself and says that Zeus and Themis were the parents of the Moray, and that Zeus gave them control over the good and evil fates of mortals. So, once again we have a difference in parentage for some of the divinities, and once again we have Hesiod seemingly hinting at two different mythic traditions. The ancient Greeks of the Hellenistic period were particularly reverent towards nine archaic Greek lyrical poets. These were not epic poets like Hesiod, Eumulus, or Homer. The work of these poets was supposed to be accompanied with music. Nevertheless, their poetry often touched on Greek myths. Pindar, a poet from Thebes who lived at the end of the Greek Archaic period, around 500 BC, was considered one of the best. A lot of his work survives to us today, and one of his poems tells about the wedding between Zeus and Themis. His account backs up the tradition that states Nyx was the mother of the Moirae. Pindar describes how the Moirae were already present at the marriage of Zeus and Themis, and accompanied the bride to Mount Olympus. After Themis, Zeus took another one of his aunts as another partner. This was Nemesini, another titan, the goddess of memory. Hesiod says that Nemesini lived in Pyria, a region in Thessaly in northern Greece, far, far away from the other immortals. Zeus went to her one day, and they slept together for nine nights. Now, in many Greek myths, Zeus tends to rape or kidnap women, but his time with Nemesini is described as a rest from sorrow and a time to forget the ills of the world, so it seems they both had a good time. A year passes, and Nemesini gives birth to nine daughters. The girls are described as worry-free, singing about the ways of the immortals. These are the nine muses, and they will join Zeus at Mount Olympus. The muses were very important to the poets that composed the early Greek epics. Many of the poems, Hesiod's, Homer's, and others, began by invoking the muses. For example, the Iliad begins with the famous line, Sing, O Muse, of the anger of Achilles. And Hesiod's Theogony begins with, Of the muses let us sing. The idea was that the muses brought inspiration to the poets, allowing them to tell their stories and sing their songs. Also, both kings and poets received their powers of speech from Nemesini and the muses. Traditionally, there were thought to be nine muses, and in classical Greece, they were named and even assigned specific arts and areas of knowledge. They are Calliope, the muse of epic poetry, Cleo, of history, Euterpe, of music and lyrical poetry, Arato, of love poetry, Melpomene, the muse of tragedy, Polyhymnia, of hymns, Terpiscore, of dance, Thalia, of comedy, and Urania, of astronomy. There are some traditions that state different numbers of muses. Usually in those cases, the alternative number is three. There are also some other archaic Greek poets, Alcman and Mimnermus, for example, that claim the muses were much older, being the daughters of Gaia and Oranos. In this tradition, Oranos and Gaia would have had the Hecatonchires, the Cyclopses, the Titans, and the certainly less monstrous muses as children. And I wonder if Oranos would have prevented their births as well. Another Greek poet, Pausanias, who lived in the Roman period several hundred years later, claimed that there were actually two sets of muses. One set were the daughters of Gaia and Aranos, and another set were the daughters of Zeus and Nemesini. Although, my guess is Pausanias may have just been trying to make sense of two earlier, conflicting Greek myths about the origins of the muses, and decided to instead morph these together. The muses were also sometimes associated with springs, which brings me to something else. I want to briefly talk about similar figures in another culture. In Indian mythology, there are the Asparas. They can be described as female nymphs, very beautiful, and related to clouds and water in some way, although not necessarily springs. Like the Greek muses, they were associated with art, specifically singing, music, and also dancing. Some of the Asparas even married or tried to seduce gods and mortals. With his first three partners, Medus, Themis, and Nemesini. Zeus has established himself as the embodiment of divine law and justice, divided the year into seasons, put his daughters in charge of the fates of mortals, and literally fathered the arts. 
but he is only just getting started, and an entire family of Titans is about to play another important role. You see, during the Titanomachy, the brother-sister couple of Hyperion and Thea did not side with Kronos. Their children were Helios, the Greek sun god, Selene, the moon goddess, and Eos, the goddess of the dawn. When Zeus doled out responsibilities to all the gods and goddesses, he assigns, or maybe keeps, Helios and Selene responsible for the sun and moon. So who were these three? A hymn to Helios describes him as a handsome young man with bright locks of hair enclosing a face that can be observed from far away. In other words, Helios is radiant like the sun. He shines down upon men and deathless gods. Bright sun rays beam from him, and he wears fine garments that glow. Helios drives a chariot across the sky each day, and the chariot is pulled by fiery horses. In the later periods of ancient Greece, these horses were named Pyroas, the fiery one, Aeos, he who turns the sky, Athon, blazing, and Phlegon, burning. When he reaches the highest point, at high noon, he rests for a moment and drives the chariot back down through the sky to the edges of the ocean, and travels under the earth during nighttime. Although apparently one archaic age poet, Mimnermus, said Helios made his way through the underworld asleep on a moving bed, and not in his chariot. Some other myths also say that he traveled through the underworld in a big golden cup, using it as a boat. From his vantage point high in the sky, Helios can see everything that goes on in the world. His role in several Greek myths is of an observer, and also kind of a spy. Helios tends to see things that other gods don't want to be seen, and then turns around and tells other gods about it. Because he sees everything, Helios is associated with judgment, and for that same reason, he is an important ally to Zeus, the king of the universe. For spouses, Helios is tied to several of the Oshinids. One of them is Clymene. He's also tied to another watery goddess, Rhodi, and she is the personification of the island of Rhodes and a daughter of Poseidon. With one or more of these partners, Helios had a few daughters, called the Heliades. There's also a particularly tragic myth, with Helios' son Phaeton at the center. This myth is best known from the Roman poet Ovid's Metamorphoses, but the story is also referenced earlier by the Greek philosopher Plato. In Ovid's version, Phaeton is the son of Clymene, and Helios is initially an absent father. Clymene tells Phaeton his father is the sun god, and so Phaeton sets out to meet his father and be recognized as his son. When he does meet Helios, his father calls for his embrace and does recognize him. Helios then swears on the river Styx, the river of the underworld, that he will grant Phaeton anything he desires. This is a very strong oath. If the gods in Greek myth swear on the river Styx, they may not break their promise. But Helios regrets making this oath almost immediately, as Phaeton wishes to drive Helios' chariot for a single day. Helios admits to Phaeton that he would rather refuse this request, but that he cannot break his vow. So Helios tries to change Phaeton's mind with a series of warnings, telling Phaeton that only Helios drives the chariot, and that none of the other immortals are able to, even Zeus. He tells Phaeton that the journey is very difficult, and that there are wild beasts waiting to devour him. Helios says that he does not want his gift to kill Phaeton, and promises to give him anything else, any treasure, but Phaeton refuses. So, Helios takes Phaeton to see the chariot. He yokes the horses of the sun to it, sets his sun rays in Phaeton's hair, and rubs special oil over Phaeton's face, making him immune to the hot flames from the horses. Finally, Helios gives Phaeton some advice, that he should follow the tracks left by Helios' previous journeys and not be tempted to go another way. Helios tells Phaeton he should not go too high or too low through the sky. The gates are opened as the horses snort flame and move forward, but the horses are unaccustomed to Phaeton's weight. He is much lighter than the god Helios and so the chariot feels almost empty, and the horses charge forward, leaving the track and going far too high in the sky. Phaeton can do nothing. He does not know how to use the reins, and even if he did, he is not strong enough to command the horses. So Phaeton is now terrified, and he regrets even going to see Helios to confirm his parentage. He has no idea what to do, and he doesn't even know the four horses' names. The horses, meanwhile, travel without restraint, moving every which way across the sky, through areas they have never traveled. They go high among the stars, and then low toward the earth. At this point, the heat begins to scorch the earth. Mountains and land catch fire. The ground splits apart with great cracks. Moisture evaporates. Grass turns white. Trees are engulfed in flame, and crops dry out. Great cities, including their walls, burn down. Entire countries and populations are turned to ash. The seas shrink, and fish try and swim to their deepest depths to escape the heat. Dead seals float at the water's surface, and their bellies roll upwards to face the sky. Even Mount Olympus is on fire, too. This is very much a world-destroying cataclysm, and the very fabric of the world begins to fall apart. 
Atlas struggles to hold up the sky, and the flames and heat cause the ground to break up in multiple places, and sunlight even penetrates below, through these fissures, to reach down to Tartarus. And this alarms the inhabitants, Hades, the ruler of the underworld, as well as perhaps the Titans, who are not used to seeing the light of day. Finally, Gaia, scorched and dying, calls out to Zeus, the king of the universe. She says, To the ruler of the gods, if this is what you want, if this treatment is something I deserve, then why hold back your lightning? Let the powers of your flame destroy me, let me perish in your fires, and let the majesty of the author of this disaster mitigate its pain. It's hard for me to open up my jaws to even speak these words. So Zeus goes up to the highest point of heaven. Because of the heat, there are no rain clouds for him to use. But he takes a lightning bolt, lifts it up to his ear, and hurls it at Phaeton. Phaeton is killed and the chariot is blown up, the reins, wheel axle, and spokes all going in different directions. The solar horses scatter in all directions too, and the body of Phaeton is thrown through the air and lands in a faraway land. Water nymphs make a grave for him with the words, Here lies Phaeton, who wished to guide his father's chariot, and though he died, there was great daring in what he tried. Helios, for his part, grieves Phaeton's demise. He hides his face, and the earth went without sunlight for a full day. Helios plans on denying the earth more, and says that if the other gods cannot pull the chariot, then perhaps Zeus should take it on. But the gods plead with Helios not to do this, so Helios eventually gathers the horses together and sets back to driving the sun across the sky each day. He whips the horses even harder, blaming them for Phaeton's death. I think a key moment in this myth is the action of Zeus at the end. Zeus took over the kingship from Kronos, and began creating a new order for the world, as I've already started speaking about. To Zeus, Phaeton is kind of a punk, ruining Zeus's carefully crafted world. So Zeus does what he has to do, destroy Phaeton with his thunderbolt, really the only way he can deal with problems, and save the world. Zeus's order is restored, and Helios goes back to driving the chariot each day, as he is really the only one who can do it anyway. In real life, in ancient Greek religion, white horses were traditionally sacrificed to Helios. His cult centers were at the city-state of Corinth, specifically on the Acropolis of Corinth, the large fortress on a hill that dominated the city. Helios also had a cult center on the island of Rhodes, clearly linked to Helios through his wife, Rhodey. Rhodes was the location of the Colossus of Rhodes as well, and this was a huge bronze statue of Helios and one of the ancient wonders of the world. The second child of Hyperion and Thea is the titaness, Selene. Selene, as the moon goddess, drives a chariot across the sky. The chariot is also pulled by horses, two white horses, not four like Helios. A hymn describes Selene as beautiful, winged, and radiant. She bathes in the ocean before driving her chariot each night, and like most of the female titans in this episode, Zeus and Selene had a daughter, and that daughter is named Pandia. Eos is the goddess of the dawn. And according to Hesiod, she is the third child of the titans Hyperion and Thea, although in the odd account, her parentage is different. Like her siblings, Helios and Selene, Eos also has a chariot. This one is also pulled by two horses, and they are named Firebright and Daybright. Eos is responsible for opening the heavenly gates to allow Helios to drive his chariot across the sky. Eos's partner was the younger titan, Astradius, and their children were the four wind gods and the stars. These descriptions of Helios, Selene, and Eos really showcase the importance of horses for pulling the sun across the sky, at least according to the ancient Greeks. But this is also the case in several other cultures too. The Norse Vikings, early Hindu mythology, the Romans, and several others all have chariots for the sun, often pulled by multiple horses too. But besides the chariot, another common vehicle for the sun in world myths is a boat or ship. The best example of this is probably ancient Egypt, where the sun god rides in a boat across the sky every day. This is in fact a very ancient idea, probably imagined in the earliest days of human civilizations, and maybe even older. My theory is that it's easy to imagine this. The sky is blue, after all, like every body of water. It's easy to imagine the sky as a celestial sea, with the water above us, and the sun riding in a boat, or as the boat itself, traveling across it. The solar chariot idea probably came later. Interestingly, we have some archaeological evidence of these traditions shifting in northern Europe. Petroglyphs found in Sweden show what looks like a sunship, but note that the later Norse Swedes explicitly reference chariots in their sagas. I'll return to these ideas later, when I eventually go into the Norse myths. But for now, back to Greece. 
A number of the Titans either sat out the Titanomachy or sided with the Olympians. Generally, these seem to have been either the female Titans or members of the younger Titan generations. Some of the younger males, see for example Perseus and Pallas and Astraeus, we don't really know much about. But what we do know is that they are really little more than the husband or father of a more important female deity. Astraeus was the husband of Eos, and they had lots of children together. Perses, whose name means to destroy, was paired with his Titanus cousin, Asteria. But the more important figure he is associated with is his daughter, Hecate. After he became king, Zeus provided Hecate with several responsibilities and honors. According to Hesiod in the Theogony, Zeus honored Hecate above everyone else. He gave her a share of the earth, sea, and the heavens. This should remind you of the myth about Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades drawing lots, but remember that that did not actually appear in Hesiod's Theogony. Instead, Hesiod says Zeus assigned all the gods their roles. What's interesting about Hecate here, in the Theogony, is that there does seem to be a three-way division of heaven, sea, and earth, but not including the underworld, and Hecate is related to all three of these areas. What's more, we're told Zeus did not take away anything that was Hecate's responsibility when the former Titans ruled the universe. The result is we get a pretty decent list from Hesiod over what Hecate does in the world today. She sits by kings in judgment, she readily grants victory and glory to men in battle, to whichever side she wants. Hecate is good to those who contend in sports and games. She stands by horsemen and people who travel by sea. She causes herds of livestock to multiply or to shrink. And Hecate also nurses young infants. Hecate is also, though, probably most famously, linked with the underworld and magic. But that basically comes from myths that bring together Hecate with some other gods, goddesses, and heroes. Since I've only covered creation myths so far, we haven't gotten to those myths yet, so stay tuned. We will hear about Hecate again in later episodes on the Greek myths. But I do want to talk a little about Hecate's place in ancient Greek religion. Hecate was worshipped throughout the ancient Greek world. Evidence of her worship starts in the Archaic Age, around 700 BC, and continues throughout the Classical period and right up into the Roman period. When the Greeks began to conquer parts of the Mediterranean Middle East after the time of Alexander the Great, Hecate was often compared to similar goddesses in neighboring cultures, like in Egypt, and identified as versions of the same goddesses found there. The Hellenistic Greeks actually did this with many of their gods and goddesses, believing that they were widely worshipped across the world, but just with different names. In terms of where Hecate was worshipped, she was important in the daily worship that took place within individual households, but was also sometimes worshipped alongside other deities in their temples, such as Poseidon, Athena, and some others. But she also had her own temples, in Argolis, on the Greek mainland, on the island of Aegina, and a big old temple that dates to around 500 BC, as far away as Sicily. But the biggest cult to Hecate was in Caria, a region of Anatolia or modern-day Turkey, where Greek colonies existed in the Archaic Age. Her largest temple there was at the ancient town of Ligana. You can still see the ruins of this temple today. The origins of Hecate's cult are a mystery. It's possible it originated in Caria, or at least nearby, and was adopted by archaic Greek colonizers that came to the region. Some other archaeologists think that she did originate in Greece, but that she was originally worshipped by some pre-Greek population that existed there. This brings us to the end of the pod for today. I've told you about the titans that Zeus incorporated into his new reign of the universe, the titans that fought against Zeus, Kronos, Koyos, Krios, Iapetus, and some of the younger ones, like Atlas, were defeated and punished, most going to Tartarus, but a special job and punishment of holding up the sky was given to Atlas. A few, like Oceanus, Tethys, Rhea, Hyperion, Thea, Themis, Matis, Nemesini, and Hecate, as well as others, either actively supported the Olympians, the best examples being Rhea and Matis, or at least didn't help Kronos. In response, Zeus allowed them to keep their spheres of influence or gave them new ones. At least three of them, Matis, Themis, and Nemesini, Zeus had children with. These children were important, and they directly play into how Zeus both organized the universe and consolidated power after he became king. So, here we have Zeus's universe. But, besides the deathless gods, who is going to live in it? Where are the people? In Hesiod's works and days, the Golden Age, the time of Kronos, the world was inhabited. But, these people presumably died in the Titanomachy. So, where do the new races of people come from? Well, I have one last good titan I want to talk about. 
In the next episode of Myth Madness, I will introduce the Titan Prometheus and talk about the myths that tell about the creation of human beings. So, until next time. If you're enjoying this podcast, please get the word out and tell your friends. And while you're at it, head over to iTunes and give the pod a five-star review.